what you might have heard. Okay. Excuse us with that. Then some detector types and how we would classify them. And then I'll show you some specific examples. Um, first, some gaseous detectors, since they are fairly standard and uh, might be the most familiar to you. Some active solid state detectors. And finally, some passive solid state detectors. All right, let's begin with some context. In the beginning, if we are to be believe the Greek myths, there was nothing. And then out of nothing was born Gaia, the Earth, and Uranus, the sky. And from there, basically all of the Olympian gods were born and all of the Greek myths and history has unraveled since then. Um, now, these two, Uranus and Gaia, had a very troubled relationship. And Uranus was a very angry and um, vengeful man and was at some point um, banished under the ground, under the earth itself, under even the underworld of Tartarus. And in his rage, being caged under the world, he imbued the earth itself with the energy of his rage, which created your favorite element, uranium. And as you might see from the name of Uranus, that is also why we call it uranium. That is the name giver. And the, uh, the Greek myth kind of uh, makes sense with that. And of course, also um, the planet that uh, is a source of joy for children of ages four to 94 also gets his name from our beloved Uranus. Now you might say, but uranium is not my favorite element. What's up with that? I'm like, don't worry, I got you covered. Of course, the, 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 the gatekeeper of the underworld, Hades, was called by the Romans Pluto. And Pluto, of course, is who gives the name to plutonium, your favorite element, I hope. Anyway, what does uh, plutonium and uranium have in common? Well, they're both very interesting special nuclear materials that have gamma ray emissions that we would like to measure because they al allow us to identify them. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. So gamma ray detection applications, where could we use gamma ray detectors? Of course, in accident scenarios where we you know, have some sort of nuclear incident at a, at a facility and we would like to then uh, figure out what is the danger, gamma detectors are what is mostly used for that. Then, of course, related to this source localization, be it accidental or non-accidental, we might want to figure out where sources are, and that's where gamma detectors are also very helpful. Then, of course, environmental monitoring, we might have passive or active detectors around nuclear facilities, around medical facilities, any kind of place where we might want to monitor the, um, the dose rate, such as on an airplane or in the mountains where it's higher than, for example, in the valley. Um, of course, source characterization. In all of these cases, we might want to know what is the exact source type, isotope, and masses it eventually. And these relate to, of course, safeguards efforts, treaty verification when it comes to uh, nuclear weapons, basically the mission of the IEA. Then, of course, radiotherapy, medical imaging, all sources of gamma radiation or x-rays where we might want to detect them to characterize them to know for example in radiotherapy which dose have we given to a patient and in imaging to of course optimize our imaging capabilities without irradiating our patients too much and of course as ricardo mentioned yesterday space if we want to venture into space and uh, fly to the moon there's a lot of radiation up there and we need to characterize that in order to understand how that might impact our astronauts or learn about something about the stars by just measuring gamma rays that come from our stars. The radiation detection process. We talked about this yesterday, just a little recap. We have particles that are directly ionizing. These are charged particles, alphas, betas, heavy ions. And then we have the uncharged particles where our, our, where the, our gamma rays are, which we are talking about today. And neutrons and gamma rays are both uncharged and they are thus indirectly ionizing. They don't have electric fields and thus don't in directly interact with our matter. Um, and our charged particles, it's of course fairly straightforward. We have electric fields, they interact directly with um, our material, for example, in gas, they create electron ion pairs. In solids, it's electron hole pairs. And we like electrons and ions because we can just measure that directly, the electrical signals that come from that, because that's literally what currents and signals are, electrons in movement. Now, neutrons and gamma rays interact well. Neutrons, you will learn about this next week through nuclear reactions, gamma rays through the various mechanisms that we talked about yesterday, and they all lead to then conversion of our uncharged particles into charged particles, mostly betas, but sometimes also uh, through nuclear reactions, heavier particles that then are charged, and these then we use to get our electrons to get our signals. And this, of course, then leads to 
a response in our material. Uh, we have to do some sort of analog to digital conversion if we want to, and then do post-processing on it to get all the information that we're interested in, such as energy, time, particle type, or the interaction type. Just a little summary for you, um, if you take a look at this later, photon interactions in matter can be characterized by all these different scattering events. At the end of the day, these are all just quantum mechanical scatter events of a photon interacting with an electron or a nucleus. But uh, we like to, you know, of course, split them up a little bit. This is historic reasons why they're split this way. Here I have listed them in terms of at which energies they tend to be the most dominant interaction um, form. And in red are, of course, the big three that are important for radiation detection that you learned about yesterday. So photoelectric effect, Compton inelastic scattering or pair production. Just a reminder of the total photon cross section. Here you see a plot of the um, Z, so the effective proton number of the material over the energy of the gamma. And as you can see, the big three, as I called them, have different regions of where are they are respectively dominant. So in low energy gamma, so if the gamma ray has low energy, or the material has very high Z, then photoelectric effect tends to be dominant. Then once we reach higher energies around 1 MeV, that's where Compton scattering is most dominant, as in the probability of a photon interacting through scattering is highest. But of course, photoelectric effect could still happen, but it's less likely. And finally, above several MeV, of course, us needing a minimum of 1.0022 MeV, but usually above like 2 to 5 MeV, that's where pair production becomes the most dominant or most likely interaction. Here's the example on the right of lead and its total cross-section um, for gamma rays of different energies. So that's cross-section over energy. And as you can see in blue, the total cross-section, Compton is kind of constant throughout the energy ranges. Photoelectric here in green is of course most dominant at low energies. And then once we reach more than 10 MeV, that's where pair production becomes the most likely interaction if a photon enters a piece of lead. All right, so gamma detectors can be classified by uh, their detector type. That's how I choose to classify them. We can talk about ionization type detectors. So the classic example being, of course, the ion chamber. You can talk about proportional counters, which are just ion chambers with a different voltage and Geiger Miller counters, or cloud and or bubble chambers. Then there's luminescent detectors, um, thermoluminescent, optically stimulated luminescence, and radio photoluminescence. I'm just mentioning all these words now. You will, we will be talking about some of them, but not all of them in this lecture. But here you have a complete non-exhaustive list, but almost all of them are present. Scintillation type detectors, so your classic inorganic solids, organic crystals, organic liquids, plastics, glasses, etc. Semiconductors, intrinsic semiconductors, or doped semiconductors, and chemical detectors. By that I mean interactions happen that induce some sort of chemical reaction, and then we get our detection process thus. Um, and finally, a sort of a new type of detector is perovskites. Um, they fit somewhere between scintillation and semiconductors, depending on how they interact, uh, how the material is um, constructed. And that's going to be part of tomorrow's lecture, so stay tuned for that. First, I'm going to talk about ionization type detectors. All right, so gas, gaseous ionization detectors. Here in the background, you see an image that you might have seen before. That is also what the introduction slide was. This is what it could look like if you overlay the tracks of a cloud chamber. And I'll be uh, swiftly mentioning what that kind of detector is. A cloud chamber, if you put a uranium rock into it, this is what you see what you will get. Uh, uranium, of course, has many um, decay channels. If we consider uh, a standard uranium nucleus, say 235, you will have alpha decay as a possible decay branch, beta decay, spontaneous fission, they're all possible. Um, and a lot of these decays, of course, then have gamma rays that are emitted um, after, say, after beta, you usually get a gamma ray, and after spontaneous fission, you get several gamma rays. Now, these particles then in a cloud chamber, and that's what you see here, uranium rock in a cloud chamber, leave these tracks, but that's only the case for charged particles. So, if we talk about gamma ray detection, what we see here is actually the already converted particle. So we would see, an, for example, a gamma ray that exited the uranium, interacted with an electron in the cloud around it, and then we see the electron causing this track. 
If it's a shorter and thicker track, that's probably an alpha particle. And yeah, this is probably something you have seen before. Uh, just to introduce you how that how that works, this whole system. Um, the bottom of the system, we have a, something cool, something cold, typically dry ice or uh, Peltier elements that keeps everything at freezing temperatures. Then above all of this, we have in a heating duct, an alcohol that we heat up so that it vaporizes. So it's at you know uh, superheated temperatures, it is vapor. This vapor now enters into the main volume where we want to detect particles. It sinks down in a temperature gradient. It now will cool down. And once it reaches its temperature where it should turn into a liquid, we call this supercooling. And now your liquid, your vapor is supercooled and should turn into a liquid, but it doesn't have any nucleation sites to turn into a liquid. So this is where the cloud chamber genius comes in. And now a charged particle that interacts with this super saturated or supercooled alcohol will cause ionization. And the ionized, ionized gas actually, or the ionized alcohol will act as a nucleation site. And then we get these clouds or liquid basically forming in the air where the particles crossed. And that allows us to sort of visualize where the particles are exiting from this um, piece of uranium rock. Now, uh, if you build bigger cloud chambers, that is also actually what was among the first gamma detectors ever used, then you can get these kind of um, nice images where you just track these um, tracks that the charged particles create. And then you can sort of start imagining what kind of interaction actually caused this kind of track. And this is actually a question for the chat. Um, there's a gamma ray that entered here. What happened at this point of interaction? I'd like to see only the right answers now in chat. <laughs> See one suggestion, pair production with a question mark. I'll wait for a few more answers. What do you think happened here? Pair production without a question mark. So that's more assertive, I like it. All right, so indeed what happened here is a gamma ray enters the cloud chamber and interacts with an electron, and we get indeed pair production. So it um, spontaneously decays into an electron and a positron, and this happens at a recoil with a recoil electron, and the recoil electron carries a lot of energy away from this as well, and that's why we have these three tracks. Um, note, please, that uh, pair production does not happen in vacuum. A gamma cannot spontaneously decay into a charged and a negatively charged. Uh, matter antimatter pair, it always has to recoil off of an electron, or here on the case in the right, it's a nucleus. Because we don't see a track, so likely the nucleus was just very large and we don't see a track, but the electron and the positron, of course, cause a track. Now, uh, a final question why would this be curved, the path of the electron and the positron? Charged repulsion is not bad, but not quite there. Electromagnetic covers it. So since it is so nicely curled, this is likely a magnetic field that has been applied as shown here. So you apply a to the image here, a vertical magnetic field. And then of course the electron and the positron will be um, accelerated in the respective opposite directions, if you want, if you will, by the Lorentz forces caused by the magnetic field. All right, so ion chamber, how does this work? So again, we have the same uh, concept as before. We have a gas filled space. This time we just use two electrodes and, and apply an electric field onto it. So you're on the right, you see how that apparatus might look like uh, simplified speaking. So you have, you know, anode cathode, you apply a DC voltage source and somewhere along this uh, chain, you put also a a device that can show you what current is flowing so you can see the signal. Now a gamma ray then comes, in this case from the left, interacts with an electron. In this case, let's call it maybe a photoelectric effect. The electron has now a lot of energy and crosses the detection volume. It will ionize the volume and um, create electron ion pairs. Uh, 
And now these electrons and ions respectively migrate to the charge location where it makes most sense, as in the electrons will travel to the anode and the ions to the cathode, and we thus get a signal that can be measured across our resistive device. Ion chambers, of course, can be operated at different voltage ranges. And I'll quickly just mention this um, for, your, um, for the record. Uh, if we talk about ion chambers, we typically mean hundreds of volts applied to this capacitance that I just mentioned to the gaseous volume. And this then we call an ion chamber, uh, typically used for dissymmetry. Um, finally, if we increase the voltage into the region of thousands of volts, that's when we talk about proportional counting. Um, and then once we reach more than that voltage, we talk about the Geiger-Müller counting region where basically the whole um, detector discharge, discharges because the voltage is so high that uh, the whole detection volume gets um, ionized. And I'll quickly show you how that works. In the avalanche formation in an ion chamber, the primary electrons, of course, induce secondary ionizations, and these then build these mini avalanches towards the anode wire, and we get a large signal. But if the electric field is large enough, then these electrons actually um, liberate low shell um, or inner shell electrons, and we get X-rays or UVs that can then cause secondary ionizations along the anode wire, and we get these huge amplifications. This happens typically above say 1,800 volts in such a ion chamber. And then the multiplication of a single electron that got excited, say, uh, again, ejected by a photoelectric interaction, say by a gamma ray or a Compton scatter, uh, gets multiplied by 10 to the eight times. And we get a huge pulse of uh, charge that we can measure very simply. And this can be measured either by um, electronics, as I showed you, to put a resistive, de resistive device into this and you will see a pulse or what has been uh, more classically done as well, you just connect this device to a microphone and then you just listen to the clicks. And this is, I think, something that you might be very familiar with. This is the sound of a Geiger Miller counter. You see here on the left, the, the device itself. So you have the tube uh, in black. That is the, um, the gas filled uh, chamber that has been a high voltage of around uh, 1,500 volts. And then each time a gamma ray, typically gamma rays, because it has such a thick shell, so alpha particles or betas typically don't enter the volume. So it's usually gamma rays enter the gaseous volume, liberate some electrons that have high energy now through an interaction process that we just talked about. And then they cause this clicking sound. And if you, you just amplify that signal coming from that, um, that discharge uh, in the ion chamber, you get this that uh, is so characteristic of these Dagger Miller counters. All right, moving on from ion chambers and the more uh, Hollywood-esque type of uh, measuring gamma rays, we'll talk about scintillation detectors. What you see here is a, a scintillating material under UV light, and it, uh, it emits light at a different wavelength because it's under UV, but we see blue light. And that's actually how these materials work. And we'll be talking about this briefly. Again, when we talk about classification by a detector type, we talked about ionization detectors. Now we'll be talking about scintillation type detectors. So in scintillators can be broadly classified into organic type scintillators, where the scintillation light comes from uh, molecular electrons, so carbon hydrogen bonds. Um, these materials have fairly low density and low Z. Um, or into inorganic scintillators, where the scintillation light yield comes from electrons, uh, free electrons in the crystal lattice. These have tend to have higher density and higher Z, uh, which both have their respective ups and downs when it comes to gamma ray detection. The detection principle is as follows. Here on the right, you see a little schematic on how that might work. So we have at the top a scintillator, which is just a volume. In this case, it could be a crystal, it could be a liquid, it could be whatever your scintillator is. In this medium, the excitation caused by the gamma ray, uh, be it, again, through photoelectric absorption, Compton scatter, or pair production, or multiple of these interactions, now are converted through the scintillation process into visible light. The visible light now interacts with a photomultiplier tube, um, a filter multiplier tube, just to quickly uh, reiterate how it works. Uh, 
um, light interacts with a photocathode, uh, which then emits electrons. These electrons are um, accelerated in these so-called dynodes on the right to amplify them to then get a readable signal because single electrons are hard to measure. But once we have thousands, tens of thousands of electrons, then over a resistive device, we get nice pulses that we can use for our using this as a detector. So radiation interacts with the scintillation material, energy deposition by these various pro, um, processes that I just talked about, de-excitation via luminescence, that's the important part that we get light instead of electrons in this case, and the light signal collection, amplification and conversion. So a typical example is using again a photomultiplier too, but there are other ways to do it. You could also just use a standard camera for this if it's sensitive enough. In inorganic scintillators, just to talk about the specifics of the scintillation process, it's based on, uh, if you had some solid state physics, on the band gap model and the behavior of liberated electrons in a crystal lattice. So ionizing radiation can create electron hole pairs by basically we have a gamma interacting with a valence band electron. It lifts an electron into the conduction band. And now the electron uh, will find a lower energetic state which it will sort of decay into. And this could be um, in, a, in, a pure, um, in a pure band cap model without uh, um, impurities, there would be only band to band recombination. But in this example that I'm showing you here, there are several options that the electron has, namely by uh, introducing impurities into the material, we get these intermediate uh, levels. And then the electron can be captured, as you see on the left, uh, into so-called uh, luminescence centers or activation centers or into electron traps. And luminescence centers, as you see, that, that's where the energy difference in the decay just gives us something in the visible range, so several electron volts, and that's why we can see it. Uh, alternatively, they can get stuck in electron traps, and this leads um, to these traps to then decay a bit later, and that gives us afterglow or uh, delayed luminescence. And an example of this would be putting thallium into iodine. Um, you, once you introduce thallium, that's how you get these intermediate levels that act as light emission centers in a scintillator. Examples of this could be zinc sulfide. That's a very classic one in terms of uh, having very high light, light yield efficiency. This was also used by Rutherford because um, he was able to see the scintillation by eye, and that's why it's such a uh, was used at the time. But the decay time is like beyond tens of microseconds, and that's for modern detection systems just way too slow. And we would like to see it a little bit faster. So modern, more modern detectors include sodium iodide, again, with the th thallium dopant such that we get these intermittent uh, energy states in the band gap to get the luminescence light, uh, decay time just uh, uh, less than a microsecond, high Z, so that's nice because we get the good gamma ray detection efficiency, uh, but the disadvantage is it's hydroscopic, so we must protect it with these casings, as you see on the right, because they just soak up all the water around and the humidity and will crack and break. Uh, an alternative to this would be cesium iodide, also doped with thallium, um, easier to handle, less susceptible to all kinds of thermal and mechanical shocks, less hydroscopic, but more expensive. Other examples include barium fluoride. That's a, I don't, this might be old information, but it's, I think it's the fastest known scintillator with only hundreds of microseconds pyros, of, uh, of a main decay component. It has a secondary slow component of a few hundred nanoseconds, likely due to, as I mentioned, uh, shallow electron traps in close to the uh, conduction band, and it has very low light yield. Um, as you might have might have realized by now, uh, fast scintillators tend to have lower light yield, so there is a trade-off there when choosing a scintillator. The faster it is, the less light it yields, so you need more amplification to actually see the light. Then BGO, bismuth germinate, also very classic material, very high Z, very highly efficient in uh, absorbing uh, photons and non hyperscopic And finally, lead tungsten, it's very high Z, faster than BGO, and used at Alice, for example. Here on the right, you see this detector um, at CERN to study lead light collisions and high energy physics. Just a little example of what this looks like. So you have a sodium idea detector that you want to use. First, you have to grow a crystal, and I invite you to look into this further how this is done. It's very interesting. These crystals then need to be machined and put into these reflective coating and encapsulation so that we as to protect them from light and from moisture. 
And then we attach, as I said, a photomultiplier tube or PMT to them, which then allows us to read out the electronics, uh, the signals, and to apply, of course, high voltage to our light amplifier. The PMT needs a little extra voltage to work. And this example here on the right is by Miriam Technologies. You just connect it by USB to a computer and you'll get your signals read out straight away. And then the application of this is, of course, we have a gamma reading sample. We have our uh, sodium iodide detector ready with its PMT uh, with a high voltage applied. We digitize the pulses, and then we can do these plots here that you see on the right. And red is what the sodium iodide would give you um, with uh, two peaks here at 1.1 and 1.3 MeV. Um, that is, of course, our favorite source, cobalt-60, that we're measuring. Um, in blue, you see what a semiconductor would give you. And this is a little sneak peek about something that I won't be mentioning in detail too much, but semiconductors actually have much better energy resolution. And I'll just quick briefly mention this now. Um, after I talk about organic scintillators. So organic scintillators have, of course, little to do with the food label. It's more about that they are actually um, related to that. We, it's uh, <laughs> organic molecules that do the scintillation instead of uh, a classic inorganic band gap. This is what it looks like if you have a fairly complicated pi bound bond in, um, in a more complex molecule. And here we have two luminescence mechanisms which have different time behavior, notably fluorescence, which is once we have reached excited states, as is here on the right, S0 would be the ground state and S1 and higher would be excited states that we would um, get, of course, by some charged particle in the vicinity, um, suggesting that these electrons reach these states. Um, the direct transition of these um, states takes only very little time, and that's why we get these fast decays. And then, of course, we have um, quantum mechanically forbidden, uh, so-called forbidden states where the um, electrons have parallel spins, and these are so-called triplet states, and these decay very slowly because of this quantum mechanical exclusion rule, and these can happen uh, either through so-called intersystem crossing excitation or um, the linear energy transfer of the particle also affects how many triplet states are excited, and this takes, gives us a much slower decay um, compared to the fluorescence. It can be just microseconds, hundreds of nanoseconds. In some cases, um, phosphorescence can be even minutes. So depending on your material, this actually can take a long time for the afterglow to go away. The properties of organic scintillators are thus, scintillation light from molecular electrons, mostly from carbon hydrogen bonds, where I showed you this fairly complicated excitation scheme with a lot of excited states and a lot of uh, de-excitation possibilities that give us then the light. Um, and this gives us the possibility to use fast pulse decay um, to, for signal processing. They are, however, low density and low Z. So typically they have, tend to have lower gamma detection efficiency um, compared to similar detectors of their size in inorganics because of the low Z and they interact mostly only through Compton interaction because photoelectric effect is exceedingly unlikely or impossible in pair production uh, because the low Z also tends to be unlikely. Now, here you see a pulse in a um, organic scintillator for three different particle types. And as you can see, we get more light and it decays slower if it's um, more, if it, if it has higher linear energy transfer, if it's just a more charged, uh, sorry, more higher linear energy transfer, as in it ionizes more heavily locally. Gamma rays tend to not ionize locally, so you end up getting a fast decay of the pulse. Fast neutrons cause more local ionization, you get a longer tail, and alpha particles are really heavily locally ionizing, and you get a very long tail. And we use this tail integral actually to construct these so-called tail over total plots. And this is for an organic glass uh, scintillator. You can see if we take the tail integral and divide that by the total, we can see that we can uh, actually distinguish neutrons from photons because neutrons tend to have this longer tail. And indeed, if we plot it this way, we can distinguish them and then put a line, as I show here in white, in between them to then classify pulses being uh, photons or neutrons. Just a little overview for your uh, records. Types of organic scintillators include plastics. Those tend to be extremely fast, uh, very flexible materials. You can make films, sheets, fibers out of it. Uh, but they are can be tricky to construct because you need sometimes wavelength shifters um, so that the fluorescence 
happens at a wavelength that is that the material is opaque to. Liquids, uh, that's also a very popular organic scintillator. So we just have molecules that tend to be liquid at the room temperature, um, require some sort of solvent typically, and also wavelength shifters, also very fast signals. And they can be loaded, say, with lithium or something to uh, introduce neutron detection capabilities. Organic crystals, anthracenes, transstilbene are very examples, also very fast um, and very high light output, um, very durable but may arguably are a bit difficult to handle, but easier than liquids. All right, just a little comment before I go to passive detection systems on energy resolution. Energy resolution refers to the capacity of a detector to distinguish interactions of different energies. And here, I'll just give you some numbers with regards to how much energy it takes to create the, the uh, electron hole pairs or the electron ion pairs or photoelectrons in the different detector types. So in a scintillator, it takes about 20 to 500 eV to create, create one photoelectron. In gas, it's around 30 eV for one electron ion pair. And in semiconductors, it can be as low as three eV for one electron hole pair. And if we characterize now the energy uh, resolution of a detector by the so-called full width at half maximum, so we take the peak, go halfway down and look at how wide this peak is, we get a much better resolution for semiconductors because it takes so much less energy to create an electron hole pair that we create so many more of them. And thus we have better quote statistics on it. And here you see an example for uranium uh, and gamma line at 278 keV. So this is counts over energy. And um, you see a germanium lithium detector will have a, a broader distribution than an high purity germanium, which is an intrinsic semiconductor with a very small energy to create one electron hole pair. So we get very good statistics on this. And again, this is back to our um, plot that I showed you earlier. Um, in blue is the germanium detector, which is an intrinsic semiconductor, very, very efficient at detecting energies with high resolution. And our scintillator, sodium iodide, uh, we get very broad peaks. So in, in order to distinguish these peaks, um, we need them to be sufficiently separated so for cobalt that works, but for other isotopes, this might not be good enough to use sodium iodide. However, sodium iodide is cheap and we can just connect it to our system and it will probably work. Uh, germanium needs to be cooled down to liquid nitrogen temperatures and requires more expensive electronics. So there's a trade-off there, of course, in terms of cost. All right, so that was active detectors. And by active detectors, I mean something that you would have need electronics for while you're reading the gamma rays. So you need some sort of voltage applied and such. And I'll be talking now about, for the rest of the, the lecture, about passive gamma detection uh, using luminescent dosimeters. So why would you want to use luminescent dosimeters now that I just talked about all these awesome um, active detectors, these counters that give you cool clicking sounds or scintillators. Well, luminescence detectors are convenient because they can be very small. There is no cables, they're passive detectors. We don't need anything connected to them. Um, they can be very precise and accurate. Uh, they can be very convenient and easy to read. And what's important for some applications is that they are similar to tissue or water in terms of their effective Z. Um, so that you can give actually very good estimation of what the biological effect of these detectors of the radiation might be. Minimal influence of magnetic fields. This is relevant in some applications as I will show you shortly. And of course, minimal influence of dose rate, which is also relevant for some applications. Most detectors use these two processes, namely thermally stimulated luminescence or optically stimulated luminescence. And I'll be introducing both to you now. I'll give you an example of what these detectors look like. So on the top left, you see thermal luminescence detectors as these uh, small chips. And uh, bottom left, you see what these chips look like compared to a coin. So they can be very small and convenient to use. Um, actually, maybe a bit too small at times, you might lose them and then they, they're lost forever because they're so small. Um, and optically stimulated dosimeters, they look very similar. It's also chips like this and uh, are actually fairly, um, not distinguishable just by looking at them. They are very similar in terms of um, how they look like. And they can be cut into arbitrary sizes so that you can uh, 
uh, stuff them into whichever geometry you might need them to measure your radiation. How does it work? Well, the mechanism for luminescence, we already talked about this uh, briefly when we talked about scintillators. In a crystal, we have a balance band and a conduction band, if we're talking about a semiconductor or an insulator, where um, we may have electron traps and recombination centers because of impurities and imperfections in the lattice. Now, radiation interacting with this will liberate electrons into the conduction band. And now these electrons have, of course, uh, to find a new uh, ground, uh, um, lower energetic state, and they will redistribute into these electron traps among other channels. And the holes, we model them as uh, also moving around and they may recombine with recombination centers. Um, and thus we get a material which has electron traps where electrons are stuck in this metastable state above the valence band. And many of these traps actually are stable at room temperature. So the electrons are just stuck there indefinitely. Now what I can do is um, I take this material that has been irradiated and has electrons trapped in these metastable states and apply heat and or light so that they get excited back into the conduction band. The electrons find the recombination center and recombine with a hole and we get typically light out of this recombination. And uh, this signal, the amount of light actually typically corresponds to the amount of dose that we gave the material. Uh, as in, if we irradiate the material a lot, we have a lot of trapped electrons and then we apply heat and then we get a lot of light out of the sample corresponding to the dose. Now, again, why are there traps in materials? Just to remind you, uh, valence band and conduction band in a perfect crystal do not have intermediate ele um, electron trap states, and you will have just nothing in between. But if we now remove a few anions and cations and maybe replace them with electrons, that's how we get these intermediate electron states and these traps that we need for detection. And now irradiation happens. We create a lot of electron hole pairs and they distribute themselves along the lattice and they get stuck in these traps. Now, um, an imperfect crystal may have multiple of these trapping states. Electron traps may have different depths, as we call it, so different energies that are required in order to liberate them. And this becomes interesting when talking about um, what happens after irradiation. Now we have liberated a lot of electrons and holes, and they redistribute respectively into these traps. Um, at certain temperatures, for example, at room temperature, shallow electron traps might just start decaying away. The electrons get enough energy from room temperature to get into the conduction band and recombine. And, um, um, and that already leads to a certain sort of afterglow and that could be referred to as phosphorescence in some cases. Now, if we want to actually read out a material um, using thermal luminescence, the, the method I mentioned, we would apply heat to the material and heat it up to say up to 400 degrees centigrade. And so we apply heat to these, this whole material and then we, we literally just heat it up and wash it um, over temperature, uh, what, how much light it emits. And as you can see, this is the typical signal for aluminum oxide. Um, at around 180 degrees centigrade, you would get that peak. Uh, so you would get a lot of light because, and this is just uh, following this hypothesis that we have these electron traps. There are a lot of electron traps that are um, liberated around the thermal energy of 180 degrees Celsius. And the equivalent uh, is true for OSL or optically stimulated luminescence. Now, instead of applying heat, I apply light. And now it's just an exponential decay. As the electron traps slowly empty, I get light emitted from the sample uh, through the optical stimulation. Now, uh, material examples include aluminum oxide. And at the bottom, you see another very top popular TLD material, lithium fluoride, that is then doped with magnesium or titanium or others. And um, what's interesting about these materials is that they have fairly similar um, thermoluminescent peak structures. So you heat them up and around 180 degrees Celsius, that's where they show this strong light emission if you previously irradiated them. Um, as you can see, aluminum oxide has a very simple single peak, whereas lithium fluoride tendencies, you see the trap structure is a lot more complicated. You have like four peaks. And uh, interesting example here, if you look at the OSL signal, so the optically stimulated light coming from these two samples. Here I'm comparing aluminum oxide to lithium fluoride uh, for different doses. And you see basically lithium fluoride does not react to optical stimulation. 
um, but aluminum oxide very much so does. So some of your materials might be thermoluminescent, some materials might be optically stimulated, luminescent, and some might be one or the other. And here's a little video of what uh, thermal stimulation, thermally stimulated luminescence or TL looks like. So here you have a heater plate on the left that we are, um, is now at like 400 degrees Celsius. And uh, I'm about to put a sample on top of there. And you'll see then how the sample lights up and aluminum oxide lights up at uh, in the blue range. So you should see that blue glow. And there we go. We see that blue emission while it reaches the 180 degrees Celsius. And then I'll just pause there where you see the blue. And then of course, eventually the electron traps are all empty and then it just stops glowing blue. The same could be done for feldspar, which is just a, a type of rock that you might find in the wild. If you do that the same with that, you get this nice green thermoluminescent light. And this is again, just because if you find this kind of material, it is irradiated by natural irradiation, by natural background, and then it will uh, show this kind of light if you heat it up. All right, so how does the uh, thermoluminescence measurement setup look like? We need a heater and we just heat up the material. We get the thermoluminescent light and uh, then we just collect it with a PMT. That's it, very simple. Um, optionally, we can use optical filters to sort of narrow a little bit down what we wanna look at. If we wanna look at only green lights, for example, or blue lights or certain traps might have certain colors. So then we can distinguish that a little bit. Um, for optically stimulated uh, luminescence, it's a bit more tricky. We need a light source, typically a laser or an LED that illuminates the sample. That one might be, for example, a green light. Uh, the OSL that is then emitted can be blue. So then we need, of course, a PMT and filters to then uh, filter the, blue, uh, the green light out so that our PMT doesn't get burned by all that green light because the stimulation needs to be intense, but we want to see the blue light. All right, where can we use optically stimulated luminescence? I think space is a very great example where this can be used um, because as I said, we have several nice properties of luminescent detectors that make them favorable for this. Um, as, I, as you remember, there are these small little uh, films that you can make, that's aluminum oxide films that you see there on the bottom right. And you know we can just, this is a uh, picture from the ISS. Um, they're very small, they're highly sensitive. They have no cables, no power consumption. They're always on and measuring. And you can have uh, density and ZF similar to tissue. So we, we have these phantoms, as you see here on the left. So that's just human models that have similar density to us. And then we can measure what the dose rate effects or dose effects on, the, on this phantom are. And they're very precise. We can get down to 1% accuracy with these detectors. Um, and they're very sensitive to all kinds of radiation. And this is an example where everywhere in the ISS, one measurement campaign put the simeters to measure what kind of dose do astronauts get. And of course, this is much easier to measure. You just put these little films and weight is everything when it goes to space travel, put them on a rocket, shoot them up, and that's gonna be a few hundred grams max of weights that you need for that. And then you just send it back on a capsule and you can read them out down on earth because uh, that's how convenient these detectors can be without any electronics or digitization needed in space. Another application would be radiotherapy. So for uh, tumor control using radiation, here you might uh, understand that there are very steep dose gradients. You want the tumor to get all the dose and the healthy dose, the tissue to get none of, none of the dose. And that means there's a strong gradient. And we would like to measure, of course, the doses along this gradient very accurately. And building small ion chambers is very tricky, but taking small TLDs and just cutting it to the shape that you need, that's actually fairly easy to do. Then there's, of course, quenching effects. If you use heavier ions for um, uh, radiotherapy, if you use protons, helium, carbon, then it becomes very tricky to interpret sometimes ion chamber measurements, magnetic fields, of course, mess around with ion chambers. So that's where these decimeters might be useful. And in pulse fields, that's another uh, kind of worms that I won't be discussing much, but all of these need high precision, low Z effective so that it's similar to human tissue and not affected by the magnetic fields, the dose rate, et cetera. We might need 2D information. We might need 3D information or even 4D if we're tracking uh, a human that is breathing at the same time. And we would like to measure the dose and luminescence dosimeters might be just the tool for that. Another application of luminescence dosimetry, as you uh, might have thought earlier before, is dating. So I take dig up material and I put heat it up and it will emit light based on how much 
it was exposed to radiation. And I'm just showing this one slide here with a little, uh, a few papers that you can take a look at if you're interested in this. But as you can see here, we can determine the age, and that's the middle top uh, figure there. We can determine the age based on how much thermally or optically stimulated light we get out of a sample. Um, but of course, if a sample tend by geological forces was pushed to the surface and exposed to the sunlight, then all of those electron traps get emptied, so we can't measure uh, super far into the past. But if a sample tended to be in the un underground long enough, we can get fairly precise within, for thousands of years, OSL works quite well. And finally, uh, the last example I want to talk about is emergency dissymmetry. So imagine emergency situation. A nuke goes off. And this is the simulated response of a 10 kiloton highly enriched uranium improvised device, something that a malicious um, agent might come up with if they have access to the material. In such a scenario, we might have an immediate fatalities uh, count of above 50,000 and injuries in the hundreds of thousands. So in such a situation, of course, care facilities are immediately up at capacity. Every hospital in this environment will be just inundated with people. And what we need then is, and you might have learned this word in the recent years, triage procedures, in order to separate people who are just well worried that they just saw a nuke go off, but they're, um, that they're worried that they might die from people who actually require care right now in order to maximize the odds for survival. Now, we know from mostly from Chernobyl with victims that doses above two gray warrant immediate care to maximize the odds for survival. If it's below two gray, believe it or not, you can wait a week and then help these people. But two gray is when you need to help basically right now. Now, how would we measure doses like this? Because if this goes off in a city, not everyone is wearing an ion chamber with them. And that's where uh, biological diagnostic, tool, diagnostic tools might work. You want to measure the white count, but that takes also hours, if not days. And that's not going to work in a, such a uh, scenario where large scale amounts of um, individuals are irradiated. So what we use is the dose from materials in the environment as a surrogate. And that's where luminescent materials come into play. So we use, get the dose information from so-called fortuitous luminescent dosimeters. So materials that are in the environment around uh, or that the person is likely to have on them during exposure. So what could be a fortuitous luminescent dosimeter? Well, one example could be your face mask. And you might ask what my face mask is a radiation detector. Well, indeed, because, well, fortuitous dosimeters require several uh, characteristics. They need to be ubiquitous among the population. We need a proportionality to the received dose, sensitivity below the aforementioned two gray to know whether a person needs immediate help or not and simplicity and speed of uh, dose information retrieval. And indeed, if we uh, look at face masks, um, they contain calcium carbonate, which is just the uh, white stuff you see in your coffee machine if you haven't cleaned it recently. And that's used as a mineral filler in face masks. If you look at the fabrics in detail and you zoom in, you see that these fibers are actually filled with calcium carbonate because that makes the material more breathable and better for the skin, I don't know, something like that, and also cheaper in manufacturing. And well, calcite or calcium carbonate actually has a TL response. If you heat it up, you see here for different doses that you give it, you would get uh, these two peaks here. You get a nice light response from it. And therefore, reasonable hypothesis would be, well, calcite has a thermal luminescent response. Therefore, your face mask should have a response as well. And indeed, this is something that I uh, tested. You take your face mask, you punch some holes into it. We wanted simple sampling, so we just use a hole puncher. We take those samples. We put them into a fancy heater that has a photomultiplier tube on top of it. In this case, it's called the Rezo TL reader, but it's basically just a light enclosed device that is a fancy heater that measures then the light coming out of a heated sample. And indeed, as you can see here, bottom left, if we compare calcite or a calcium carbonate sample to a face mask sample, we get indeed a, sim indeed a similar peak structure, which means that our hypothesis is probably true. Indeed, we can see radiation that was onto your face mask. And if we do this now, won't go too much into the detail how the analysis works, but we integrate these light yields. And then you can see here the integral thermoluminescent light. Here on the right, we, bottom right, we see the integral thermoluminescent light over dose. And above around one gray, we get proportionality. So uh, your face mask is actually a dosimeter, uh, potentially usable in emergency situations. Finally, I want to talk about other fortuitous dosimeters. Your face mask is not the only device that has a luminescent response. 
uh, your iPhone or your smartphone probably as well. The protective glass actually has an OSL response that can be used as well. So you might want to uh, give up your phone when you've been radiated because then they can maybe determine if you're uh, in trouble or not. Uh, of course, we, uh, uh, interestingly enough, recently it was discovered that popular medicines such as ibuprofen also has an OSL response. So if you're carrying those with you, those might be a bit more, let's say, easy to yield to uh, the hospital that you're checking into than your smartphone. Um, in, in case of a, a radiological accident. Then, uh, it turned in, then it, there's also been experiments uh, to a bit more obscure luminescent materials such as chip cards for emergency dosimetry. So if your credit card can give you your dose, then of course, bottom left, I'm talking about, uh, I'm showing a paper where people looked at tobacco dust. So maybe your cigarettes can do that as well. And then even more obscure salty trackers, they tend to have a nice, um, luminescent response. Um, and you might think, uh, why would they have that? Well, because crackers, as you can see in the materials and methods here, if you buy the original crackers, they have 1.7 grams of salt per 100 grams of cracker. And the salt is the material that has a luminescent response. So that's why you can use them. And uh, even more obscure would be insect wings. Insect wings apparently also have an OSL response. As you can see, if you have a fancy um, readout device, you can put all kinds of stuff in there because you only have to heat it or irradiate it and heat it up and see if it emits light. And um, you can also do this with, what's the final example? Dose dependence of the thermal luminescent signal of paprika. So as you see, if you irradiate paprika, you also get these thermal luminescent curves that resemble other materials as well. So next time you season your food, remember it's a radiation detector at the same time. And with that, uh, some final remarks. When choosing a gamma detector, there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, the why, application in mind. Are we doing identification, quantification, monitoring, or research? Uh, what are the source characteristics, if known? Energy, activity, composition, uh, geometry, location, 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 always important. What is the detector material? We talked about a few types, but there's a lot more. What is the effective Z? Because that affects how gamma is tracked with it the light or charge yield, um, decay times, amplification needs, expected signals where there'll be dead time saturation or no signal at all because I'm too far away or it's well shielded. Associated electronics, do I need to bring a high voltage device or a computer or can I just passively detect and then just read it out later? And then of course, digitization and readout needs to be figured out all whilst considering the cost versus utility of all this detection. And with that, um, sorry, I'll, just quickly um, mention fair use uh, claim for all the images and that as such that I use. This is for educational purposes. Finally, for bibli bibliography, um, already in, uh, in ancient Roman uh, Greek uh, philosophers' times, Plato and Aristotle walked around and they had books, as you can see. And these books are, oh, would you know, it's the radiation detection and measurement book by Null. That is what most of the lecture actually is based on. So if you want to check it out, it's a late Professor Emer Emeritus actually from University of Michigan. This book is an excellent starting point to get more information on this topic. And with that, here's more bibliography if you want to uh, see it more explicitly and image attributions. And thank you for your attention. We have, I think, a few minutes for questions before we adjourn. Uh, thank you for your attention. All right, I see, I'll start with a few questions that I see here in chat. So, is there a way to differentiate between gamma rays and X-rays with the same energy? And the answer to that is no. They are essentially the same thing. Once they are emitted, you have no way of distinguishing them because it's just a photon that has an energy and that's the information we have about it. Now, that being said, if you are measuring um, gamma rays or X-rays of a certain energy, you might want to figure out what the source is and then the source will tell you well, is it X-rays or is it gamma rays? Because the source is what determines whether it's an X-ray, it's a gamma ray. Um, but once it's emitted, it's out there, it's a photon of a certain energy. 
calling it gamma ray and x-ray only matters when it comes to the source, but it can't be differentiated other than that. We have a question about, for a given scintillator, does higher energy always produce more photons or is there a particular energy range that is a sweet spot which produce the most photons? Um, I'll answer that first before I answer the second question. Yes, there is indeed a sweet spot. Um, that is because, not, uh, because the interaction probability with higher energy actually decreases. If you have a detector or a scintillator that's say 10 centimeters across, you will have a high interaction probability for photons of say up to five MeV. But once you have photons of say 10 MeV, then they have a very high probability of just passing through the detector without interacting. So if they interact, yes, you get a large pulse and you will get a lot of uh, say secondary um, particles that you can detect, but typically you are most sensitive to the photons that are more likely to be stopped within the detection volume you have. So if you want to detect high energy particles, I think that's the next part of your question. So for example, detecting three GeV cosmic rays, that's where you really want to have large detectors to really stop them properly. Um, because with small detectors, they will just pass through and you have a very small chance of interaction. How does photon polarization play a role in gamma detection? Does it at all? As a good question, I would say it does not have an effect in terms of um, average behavior because we're looking at a lot of hundreds or tens of thousands of interactions of photons with matter. And there those things kind of average out. For an individual interaction, the polarization of course matters and the quantum scattering probabilities are changed, but that's sort of more of an academic exercise for individual interactions. Whereas for radiation detection, we care more about like bulk properties, how many thousands of photons were created for interaction. All right, another question. Has the fortuitous luminescent detectors be used in real-time detection of dose during emergency? If yes, how much time would it take to de determine the dose? So fortuitous luminescent dosimeters are thankfully only, or to my knowledge, are an academic exercise. We have not had a case where someone has gotten irradiated and then we needed this technology. So no one has actually been irradiated and then their dose was determined through their smartphone or their salty crackers that they had been eating at the time. Um, but in, in the spirit of emergency preparedness, we of course want to know what if. So that's why this has been studied. And that's why we know that it takes around I think 10 to 20 minutes per sample. So you take your smartphone, you break a piece of the glass off, you put it into a heater, heat it up, and that takes five minutes. Then you need to normalize the dose. Um, so you irradiate the material and then read it out again. And that's how you get your relative dose response. And um, that all might take up to 10, 15 minutes to get the idea of how much dose this person received. And to my knowledge, fortuitous decimeters have not been used yet, but as with any emergency technology, it's better if we never have to actually use it. We just want to be prepared. Okay, final question. Is there a material that uh, could be used to reduce the energy of the high energy particle to increase the probability of subsequent detection? Um, that is a good question. That is something that um, basically bothers most um, spacefaring enthusiasts, because if you want to travel to space, most of the interactions or the dose you receive will actually come from um, high energy cosmic rays. So particles in the giga electron volt energy range. And once they interact with some of the molecules in your body, you'll get a large shower of, of, of secondary particles and then the subsequent DNA damage that we want to avoid. And um, there is actually no straightforward way to do this because if you build a shielding around the spacecraft, that's first of all, very heavy. And actually 
you have to build your shielding very thick because if you do a thin shielding, you actually um, cause the highly energetic particle to split into uh, smaller constituents, so secondary particles of say from one GeV and you get now thousands of particles of one MeV and the one MeV now will irradiate your body very effectively because the cross-section of interaction with one, one MeV particles is very high with your body. So just putting a say, uh, a, a thin um, shield, shielding of lead around a spacecraft will actually make the dose to the astronauts worse than having no shielding. Um, so in order to have that uh, shielding problem solved, you would probably need water plus lead and a lot of it. So that's the one problem where basically reducing the energy of high energy particles is actually not directly possible, um, especially when it comes to gamma rays. Now, neutrons, they have the property of scattering around with hydrogen, and you'll be learning about that next week, how maybe high energy neutrons can be slowed down by a water shielding. That's where it works quite well. But gamma rays tend to be the nastiest when it comes to uh, shielding and um, detection because they have this just so strongly penetrative characteristic. All right. I guess that is time then. If you have further questions, you may of course email me. My email has been at the bottom of most of the slides and we will see you tomorrow for another lecture on perovskite detectors. Thank you for tuning in.